Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. It's great for us to come together in worship. Linda and Chris are going to lead us this morning. Um, I'll come back at the end, uh, one or two announcements for you and uh, to break out into breakout rooms if you'd like to join others to chat things through. So we're going to begin uh, with Linda and she's going to speak to us and lead us through our worship. But let's just pray for this moment. Father, as we come together from our separate places into your presence and we come to worship you from whatever circumstance or situation, we know that you are worthy of our praise and you are worthy of us turning our hearts and our minds toward you. Lord, may this time be one in which we meet with you and hear from you as you would long to speak to us. May our worship be worthy of you this morning because we turn our hearts toward you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You might want to mute yourselves or make certain that you're muted and Linda now will lead us. I wanted to introduce you with a picture um, which uh, describes quite vividly uh, our theme for the next three weeks, um, but it doesn't seem to be coming up, so I hope you'll see it in a minute. Um, for the three Sundays before Lent, we're using a familiar verse, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Paul says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And the picture that comes to my mind is of a well-constructed building. It stands on firm and safe foundations. Its structure brings to life the architect's design. And most important, however, is the way in which the building is used. Faith in Jesus is our firm foundation. Hope for the church and the world comes to life as we build. And love is the way in which all we have constructed must be used and shared. And faith is today's theme. So I want to use Paul's prayer to the church in Ephesians uh, to encourage us, a prayer for the church, not only for his day, but for ours too. I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So we begin with the song, Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it, for by his power each tree and flower was planned and made. Jesus is Lord, the universe declares it, sun, moon and stars in heaven cry, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. Praise him with hallelujahs, for Jesus is Lord. 
Jesus is Lord, yet from his throne eternal, in flesh he came to die in pain on Calvary's tree. Jesus is Lord, from him all life proceeding, yet give his life a ransom, the setting us free. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, praise him with hallelujahs, for Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, a sin, a mighty conqueror, on death he rose, and in all his mouth shall on his name. Jesus is Lord. God sends His Holy Spirit, show you by works of power that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Praise Him with hallelujahs, for Jesus is Lord. So we come to our time of confession. We always have in our services a moment to bring to God all the things that we are burdened with, whether it's something we've done wrong or whether it's something we're anxious about. And the response today is when I say, Lord, have mercy, the response is save us and heal us. And I think in these days that just expresses where we all are um, in a nutshell. So please do join in with the dark friends. We cry to God our Father in weakness and sin. Lord, have mercy. Save, Save us, us and, and heal us. us. We confess to you our pride and stubbornness, asking you to soften our hearts. Lord, have mercy. Save, Save us and, and heal us. us. We confess to you our waywardness and self-will. Lord, have mercy. Save us and heal us. We confess to you our blindness and narrow-mindedness, asking you to open our eyes and restore our vision. Lord, have mercy. Save us and heal us. We confess to you our, our weakness and lack of trust, asking you to strengthen our faith. Lord, have mercy. Save us and heal us. Forgive all our wrongdoing and make us whole, we pray, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, whose will it is for all people to be whole. Have mercy on us and grant us forgiveness for all our sins, peace in our hearts and minds, and strength to live for him day by day. Through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And to collect the special prayer for today, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany. God of heaven, you send the gospel to the ends of the earth and your messengers to every nation. Send your Holy Spirit to convert us to the good news of everlasting life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now we'll have our reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and those with him went to Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue, and there he began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching. That's because he taught them like one who had authority. He did not talk like the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue cried out. He was controlled by an evil spirit. He said, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Be quiet said jesus firmly come out of him 
the evil spirit shook the man wildly. Then he came out of him with a scream. All the people were amazed. So they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching. And with so much authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about Jesus spread quickly all over Galilee. Our second reading comes from a little bit later in the same gospel. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue. A man with a weak and twisted hand was there. Some Pharisees were trying to find fault with Jesus. They watched him closely. They wanted to see if he would heal the man on the Sabbath day. Jesus spoke to the man with the weak and twisted hand. Stand up in front of everyone, he said. Then Jesus asked him, asked them, <clears throat> what does the Lord say we should do on the Sabbath day? Should we do good or should we do evil? Should we save life or should we kill? But no one answered. Jesus looked around at them in anger. He was very upset because their hearts were stubborn. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched his hand. And his hand had become as good as new. Then the Pharisees went out and began to make plans with, with the Herodians. They wanted to kill Jesus. And so may I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the hardest lessons I have ever learned is that however many paper qualifications for teaching you have, unless you have something else as well, something special to offer, you will not be able to take a whole class with you, as I always long to do and rarely succeeded. You have to have that certain something, that innate authority that carries your hearers with you and makes them into followers, turns a random collection of sheep into a shepherd's flock. Of course, you can be a brilliant teacher and have that wonderful authority in spades, but no formal qualifications. And that can stop you in your tracks too. In the Gospel today, we find Jesus near the beginning of his unfolding ministry of teaching and healing. And he's been invited to speak at the local synagogue. From the moment he opens his mouth, the people are riveted. We're not told that Jesus was what he was speaking about on this occasion, but the message certainly went home. Did you hear that? I've never heard teaching like that before. Nothing like the usual diet we get. That was something else. I've got to hear him again. Any idea where he's going next? You can imagine the buzz. There are three major reactions to Jesus' teaching, authority and leadership. Firstly, the people themselves, the punters. They had no doubt. They felt their spirits stir and soar as Jesus spoke. And they recognized deep within themselves that here at last was someone different, someone who spoke with a new authority, quite unlike the paper thin version of authority of the teachers of the law. And they were going to follow Jesus from now on. And secondly, there's a sharp reaction from the spiritual underworld, also in their strange way of accepting Jesus's authority, an evil spirit speaks through a possessed man. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Here is a reaction from beyond this world, from the spiritual battle between good and evil, between God 
and statement. More authenticating than anything else if authentication were needed. The evil spirit knows who Jesus is. It reacts to the challenge of his authority, not just the authority he has on earth, but also the authority he has in heaven. And Jesus deals with it, silences it, and relieves the man of his possessor as he has the authority to do. And naturally, there is a third response. You can't expect the teachers of the law, their authority roundly rejected by the adoring crowd around Jesus, not to respond. They develop a four-pronged approach which gathers pace as the Gospels unfold. They question his qualifications. Jesus is only the son of a carpenter, and like them, he does not have the proper connections. So who is he anyway? And they accuse Jesus of being possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And that by Beelzebub, it's that Jesus is able to do that, casting out of demons. And they watch Jesus closely, hoping he'll break the law by healing, in other words, working on the Sabbath. And Jesus points to a higher law of compassionate love and heals the man regardless, as we heard. And a paralysed man is passed down through a roof and Jesus says to him, friend, your sins are forgiven. The teachers of the law mutter, who is this fellow that speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus turns to the man and heals him. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He's got every right to forgive sins. It's a heavy hint as to who. He really is. So the teachers of the law are building a convincing case against Jesus. No qualifications, demon possessed, a lawbreaker and a blasphemer. Without fail, Jesus responds with authority to their challenges. He declares, I have authority to lay my life down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. So to his authority to teach, Jesus adds healing, forgiving sins, deliverance of the possessed, and the overcoming of death. No wonder the crowds followed him. No wonder the evil spirits reacted. No wonder the earthly authorities challenged. What has authority to do with faith? Acknowledging Jesus' authority over every part of life is foundational to anyone's Christian faith. Just as no one with any sense orders the construction of a building without first engaging a qualified architect and reputable builder whose names they have acquired on good authority, so should it be with our Christian lives. Faith in Jesus' authority is foundational. All else is built on our submission to him. And I'm forced to ask myself, and maybe you too, a difficult and challenging question. Do I, do we, fully recognise and acknowledge the authority of Jesus over my, over our lives? And if we do recognise that authority, what difference does it make to the way we live and the stories we tell? Now, it does sound as if I'm talking about faith, as if it was a question of perfection. People sometimes say, well, when I've got my life completely sorted, I can call myself a Christian. Well, that perfection is not going to happen if it's me or maybe even you. We are, after all, human. And it's here that a picture of a building helps again. My life is like a house with many rooms and Jesus has come and knocked on the front door. I have had sufficient faith in his authority, perhaps only the size of a mustard seed, to let him in. I am a Christian, and the vital foundation is there, firmly established. But my house, my life, has many rooms, and not all the doors are open. And as time passes, Jesus knocks on those doors too. Sometimes, it takes years to let him in, but when I do, 
my faith expands and strengthens and becomes more effective, more hopeful and more loving. So is Jesus knocking on any of your doors today? We're going to sing our creed today in the song, We Believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Father, maker of the universe, and in Christ, his Son, our Saviour, come to us by virgin birth. We believe he came to save us, for our sins was crucified, then from death he rose victorious, ascended to the Father's side. Jesus, Lord of all, Lord of all, 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 name above all names, name above all names, name above all names. We believe. Sends his spirit on his church with gifts of power. God, his word of truth, affirming, sends us to the nations now. He will come again in glory, church, the living and the dead. Every knee shall bow before him, then must every tongue. to turn to prayer. Um, so let's take a few moments to bring to mind particular people and situations where Jesus is needed. Perhaps members of our families, our friends, our neighbours, even ourselves. People may be in our community, in our country, throughout the world. Folks who are sick or bereaved or are mentally, physically, emotionally or spiritually under pressure. Have you got a collection of folks and situations in your mind? Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. I'm going to play you a video, and as I do, place whoever comes to your mind and is in your heart into the loving presence of Jesus.
So let's draw those prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, final hymn, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. It is my light, my strength, my song. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when still the stood, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From lifeless cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no schemes of man can ever put me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. And now our blessing to finish the service. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish strengthen and settle you in the faith and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with all whom you love and all you pray for now and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. It's great to worship together.
One or two announcements, folks, please, um, about the coming week. Uh, if you have any interest at all in getting any of the meaningful Easter eggs, Chris does need your order, please, by Tuesday. Uh, and uh, he will send that off and get them for you. Uh, so do be in touch with Chris, please, if or me, if you want uh, meaningful Easter eggs. You will probably have seen from my emails that Rose Morrison died last week. Her funeral is going to be on Thursday. Uh, it is only going to be at Melrose and therefore there won't be a, a church service. But some of our congregations who loved Rose have thought creatively about coming together as the hearse leaves the co-op on Thursday morning. And it might be that you'd like to join them to just be on the street, uh, as so often happens in villages. Uh, but we can do it here and we can be socially spaced, but we can show Rose's daughters how much she was loved as a member of our congregation. So uh, the hearse is due to leave the co-op at 10.40 on Thursday morning with the funeral at midday at Melrose. So do join if you're able to do that. Couple of reminders, the men's group have a quiz on Tuesday afternoon at four. Um, hope you've had the links for that. If you'd like to be involved, uh, they would love you to join them. And if you're part of the book group, a reminder that we start uh, on Wednesday at three o'clock uh, as we begin our journey together. Linda said this is one of a series of three uh, on faith and hope and love. Next week, I'm going to be looking at hope with you. I want to use a few songs that may be newer to you. So what I'm going to do this week is to send out some YouTube links, a playlist where you could uh, get to know these songs in advance so that you can confidently join in next week. Some really important ideas as we worship together around the theme of hope. So 